Before we go into the podcast, I want to just talk about a business that I've set up with my friend George. It is called the Podcast Introduction Group. So if you want to join and be able to be featured on 24 to 48 pods podcasts to be able to reach an amazing audience, this is the place you need to go to. Podcast being a guest on podcasts is automatically establishing you as an authority and is able to build your personal and professional brand. We handpick of a bank of podcasters that we have to be able to grow your business and brand. We do 100% of everything that needs to be done by my team. You do not need to lift a finger. You are able to expose yourself to new and relevant markets by going on other people's podcasts. You also are able to create brand loyalty. People will love listening to you and coming back to your products or services and it's able to increase your revenue so if you want to be able to get involved you can sign up quickly registered with a with an account manager there's an onboarding call where we target the podcasts that you want to be on the type that you want whether it's entrepreneurship business health fitness whatever it is we then match you to those podcasts and you can start your journey We have regular catch ups with our account managers and Google ranks you when people search for you. So when people are searching for you, you're able to see your podcasts at the top of the list. So if you are interested in being a podcast guest on multiple podcasts, we are the place to go. If you go to podcastintroduction.com and go and register your details, we will have a quick call with you, match your podcast that you want to be on, and we can then start this process ASAP. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Back onto the podcast then. Just one last thing before we go into the podcast, I just wanted to talk to you about the fact that I have a YouTube channel that has been going for quite some time and I am recording and releasing all of my interviews with some short videos as well on YouTube. So please do check it out, YouTube on Absolute Business Mindset. You'll see a bunch of interviews there, all the longer format interviews and some short videos as well. So please enjoy that. And here goes with the podcast interview. Today, we have Alexander Derrida, who is the co-founder and CTO at Inc. Hello, Alexander. How are you doing? I'm great, Mark. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining me today. We're going to hopefully go quite deep into your numerous businesses that you've run, all within tech and all some great businesses. And we're going to talk about Inc. quite a bit, which is an AI powered content optimization software but the podcast is called absolute business mindset the first question is always what does a business mindset mean to you well fundamentally a business solves a problem and and so it is a problem of people a problem people or other businesses encounter so a business mindset is a mindset where you're relentlessly focused on solving that problem for someone Absolutely. That's a really good. The whole idea of service, I think, is really important and solving problems, I think, are is the bedrock of what entrepreneurs are really looking for and being able to do. So I would wholeheartedly agree with you there. I just want to talk about your upbringing. So my question is, tell me one thing about your upbringing that reflects on who you are today. All right. So I was born in Belgium in Bruges. On a on a clear day, you would go up to the tower in the town center called the Belfort. And on a clear day, you could see across the channel the shores of England. Oh, right. Just a trivia thing. Now, right. Bruges is a UNESCO World Heritage uh, historical city. And if, I think in the 1500s or so, at some point, it was one of the, if not the most wealthiest city in Europe for a while. And that was when the sea, the ocean, would be a lot closer land inward than it is today. Okay. And the boats, the trade that would come internationally through the big boats, would come almost close to where the city's borders are. Okay. And so they would be able to offload it into the city and they would have what is 
sometimes considered the world's first trading marketplace, maybe even stock exchange. It's from all over Europe and the world would come to Bruges to, to sell their goods and trade their goods. And so it was a, it was a mercantile city and therefore every prince and bigwig from all over Europe needed to build their, I don't know, trade palace there to receive other people, which basically caused a big influx of money and made Bruges such a beautiful historical town. Now, you asked the influence on my upbringing. Mm. So I was born and raised there. And um, I would compare being a child in such a town as a uh, a free range chicken, as opposed to a chicken who's in a, like a factory almost. Oh, yeah. And so we had our freedom. We didn't have to wait till 15, 16 years old in America, you get your learner's permit for a car and you get your freedom. No, when we're like, Seven, eight years old, we get our bicycle and that's our freedom. Okay. And so we're able to roam and the city is safe. And that independence gives, get, I think is really healthy for children. And, and one of the things that Bruce has done for me growing up is I've, I've grown up surrounded with architectural beauty from multiple different epochs and eras. And what it does is it ingrains in you what the standard of beauty is supposed to be through different architectural styles throughout the centuries. And now when I look at something and it's just one pixel off, it's like a part of my being. I can tell it's off. I can tell it's not right. So this is something from my upbringing that I carry with me. So do you think that works all the way through to software development and things like that? So coding and aesthetics of sites or yeah. softwares and things like that's really yeah. important to you. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it's it's way beyond design and user experience even. So Plato had a concept of beauty where he basically equated beauty with almost the divine. And it's you would say, you know, the divine is larger than we can comprehend. It's ephemeral. You cannot put it in a bottle, but you can contemplate it. You can think about it. And some of the greatest thinkers and philosophers of beauty are also the people that have given us and humanity some of the most beautiful products and, and code and solutions. And then the rule is that if you do create something that is a beautiful thing, it is an instantiation of that beauty into the physical world that is also it's also a reflection of that divine beauty and since humans are spiritual creatures we interact with that beauty around us we want to we want to we want to have that iphone we want to have that beautiful thing we want it to be part of our lives and then others recognize the beauty in it and want to imitate it because they recognize that beauty. And so beauty is, it's like a candle that you put on a table in a dark room and fills the room with light. And too much of this modern era is all about creating functional things that are not beautiful. But once in a while, somebody comes around that creates something that is functional and beautiful, and it just instantly captures our heart and everybody wants a piece of it. And those name, are the So, Alexander, name me one thing in the last couple of years that either you've purchased or you've seen or you've admired that for you really hits home about something that is truly beautiful. We'll be back after a quick break. Hi, I'm Alex, the host of X Health Show. Meet the future of healthcare. Think X Men, that's X Health. Actual superheroes behind programming living cells to cure cancer once and for all. Tech that detects preterm delivery in seconds, brain computer interface, or apps that employ AI to match you, your disease, with the best treatment. X Health Show brings to you visionaries who push the boundaries of healthcare from Switzerland, the heart of Europe, and the most innovative 
innovative country in the world. Let me introduce you to their startups. Head to X Health Show, meet the future of healthcare. Happy to greet you there. There, there are many such things. And I'm living in technology, so I can admire technology. One of the things that, for example, I notice is that there's a lot of projects out there, a lot of startups, a lot of open source projects even. And I started observing how many French open source projects are like, actually really beautiful in their code and their structure. And I started to try and think and understand why. And I came to the conclusion it was that same thing. They grew up with, uh, with an eye for beauty because it is all around them. You Humans, we have the hardware. We have the same hardware. But we all grow up in different circumstances and areas. And our surroundings will nurture us towards uh, having a, an inclination or an advantage or trait in certain trait advantage in certain areas. And uh, you notice that in human resources as well. When you try to find smart math people, for example, you find them near universities and towns that are really into math. And when you try to find great design people, you find them in areas and towns that just are very beautiful as well. And so the human beings in other parts of the world have the same capacity, hardware, and so forth, but they did not have the same nurturing. Things that I personally really admire. I have, when I moved to the United States, I my grandmother passed away and I got a big old container of, of her furniture. And so one of these things is a table. And that table was made by, by my great uncle or great, great uncle or something handmade. And you look at, you look at the support, the leg of that table. Mm. And it's like, um, you know, if you can imagine like a Griffin having a leg and then standing mm. over an orb mm. and it's mm. hand carved and it's precise and it's intricate. And you could not imagine a business being profitable anymore, spending that many hours carving mm. such detail out of it. Mm. Mm. Restoring such pieces. Maybe the paint was a bit dull <laughs> and the finish was not so modern, right? But then working with a carpenter to like freshen it up and make it fit into a modern aesthetic, but retaining that root quality. We had a, we had a bunch of chairs that were filled with straw the cushions were filled with straw and we brought it to the to upholstery place and he's I've not seen this in maybe once in my life <laughs> but the wood around it around mm. the upholstery was mm. it was so intricate and so beautiful it's when people still took time to do things so yeah. we're moving into an era of fast and cheap everything we have fast fashion fast and cheap content it's yeah. if everything around us is about maximizing profit margins. And we don't think seven months ahead or where that item will be long. We just, just mm. without regard for long-term cherishing something. So objects no longer are valued for their long lasting beauty. And, and we need to change that. And that, that starts with businesses. I think a new generation of businesses will come out of this AI revolution of humans rediscovering art, artisanry, something that an AI would maybe not find efficient, but humans, because we are, we need to be nurtured in more than functional ways, right? We have yeah. emotional, spiritual, and other needs that a robot or computer does not have that needs to be filled. And one of those ways is beauty. And I believe that there is a, a real market for sustainable long-term businesses that pay attention to that. Okay. Thank you very much. So I've got so many different avenues that we can go down, but let's go with, so you started coding at 13. That's yeah. what I read. And then you did degrees in computer science. Yeah. So tell me why you chose computer science, computers, coding as your passion. And just yeah. as a side note, the second part is why did you learn Russian at the same time? Okay. So 
Coding. When I grew up, I I don't think I made too many friends, but I had a few friends, few but good friends. And one of those friends was Peter. And Peter, Peter is, is how you pronounce his name. He was he was a bit socially awkward, but he got very obsessed with with computers at that time. We would spend we would spend time together translating Windows 3.1 to Dutch. <laughs> and we had our hands on our first computer around like my age at that time was about 13. I had an uncle who figured out it was a nice supplemental form of income slash hobby to build some computers of spare parts and go to the computer store. I remember walking these little stores and, you know, browsing the little components and RAM. And then it was just a magical time. It was just magical. And my, obviously the first programming languages were like basic and then Pascal and then Delphi was an object oriented version of Pascal around when I was 16. And then one day I got internet. Now I already had access to internet from the library because my dad was, I would say a late adopter. Okay. But when I had the internet, I, my mind was just blown with what you could do there. And I realized it was the future. So I fell in love with technology at an early age. My dad is actually a world famous hairstylist. And he is, he's climbed the tallest mountains of this industry, recognized for all that. I couldn't climb the same mountain and ever exceed him. It's not possible. So I had to find my own hill. <laughs> I had to find my own place. And for me, technology was that, technology was that canvas for me. And so there this is one, like a real true love for what you can do with technology. And then the second part of it is I've always really been a bit of a philosopher. Maybe you can tell. I can but... tell. Yes. This was not originally where I thought our conversation would go, if I'm right. totally honest, but I love it. Go for it. And so one of the things about that is I'm very self-reflective. I try to understand when I do something I'm not proud of, I'm trying to understand why did I do that? Why did I make that choice? And when I do something good, I try to say, what in my environment or what in my decision-making process or what in my associations have led me to make good decisions? And so I'm always trying to understand how do I work? Why does my brain make the decisions I do? And so one of the struggles growing up with was ADHD, for example. And I didn't know I had that until later. And one day, it was like in my 20s, I figured out I had ADHD. And I was like, I got to learn more about this. So I go to this, I don't know, support group or something. And I still mm -hmm. remember, I walk up to this room and I enter this room and all these people are like, yeah, I have ADHD and so forth. And then what I heard was like one person after the next telling me their sob story on how ADHD had ruined their life. And I'm like, this is not my crowd. Mm. I am not here to hear how everything in your life is to be blamed on ADHD. I'm here to learn how to conquer it, how to overcome it. Well, would you know what? I've got friends of mine who have recently been diagnosed with autism and things in that same sphere. And they've said to me, it's actually not held me back. It's actually my superpower. So I look at the world differently to a typical, I hate that word typical and atypical and typical person, but let's just say a typical person. And actually they've been really successful in their field because of this, not despite this. Yeah. So there's this old movie. I, I hope I don't totally mess it up. My grandmother, may her soul rest in peace. <laughs> I think she had this cassette tape, VHS, a movie called Black Beauty, something mm -hmm. like that. Okay, yeah. With the and and, and I, I probably am butchering this, but I think the idea of it was this beautiful horse that couldn't be tamed. Mm, and eventually yes. somebody then 
Tame Dead and they become best friends or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And if I got the movie wrong, you definitely recognize the story. Yes, right? I do. And the story is that your unique personality traits and what you are like that beautiful horse. And you may admire it or you may lament that you don't have better transportation if you can't tame it somehow. Mm -hmm. But the essence of it is that you could look at ADHD like a handicap and blame everything in your life on it. But you can also get very fascinated by trying to understand how your brain works and how to navigate that and then basically have a beautiful horse as your best friend. And so when you when you combine these things the love of technology and the love of understanding how people work and why they make decisions then one day you discover that they intersect very beautifully in the world of marketing and what we do in the marketing field is we try to talk to people on a deep emotional level that we can resonate with them and move them in some way. Mm. And you do that with technology, not just one-on-one, -on -one, which I love, mm. but also like one to one million mm. and your message gets out there. And so this is kind of how everything just from my childhood, just like combined into this moment when I discovered I can combine these two interests I have in like one field. So how has, how do you, for you, how have you, in your words, tamed ADHD? Well, the first thing is you have to embrace yourself and love yourself. It took me a while. I don't think I, I don't think I learned to love myself till like sometime in my twenties or at least come to peace with who I was maybe rationally earlier, but like, it's important to love yourself. And I, this cannot be said enough, but if you're looking for other people to just fill a void in your life, because you're not happy with yourself, happy people attract other people want to be around you. And so it's like gravity. And so if you're looking for happiness in your life and you're waiting for other people to just fill that void, that's not the strategy I would recommend. So start with embracing yourself and loving yourself for who you are. Lower your, lower your self-criticism. It does not mean lower your self-awareness. Just stop blaming yourself and stop putting yourself down. Embrace and love who you are. Then once you do that, I think it's, about recognizing where you have strengths and weaknesses. And that can be in small things like, where do I put my keys? And mm -hmm. it can be in large things like, how did I just communicate with somebody mm -hmm. I care about? And even though I was frustrated, how do I express myself, right? Or how do I overcome the situation of a deadline or and so forth? So then what you learn when you first embrace your, it and you love yourself, and then secondly, you you start to become self-aware. What happens is that you can start also over time develop techniques to become better organized and better channel your energy. I would say there is a hack and a superpower though. See, ADHD people do ha have no problem with concentration. They have no problem concentrating. They have a problem regulating concentration. Okay. It's in a one or an, it's an on or off spot. So when you are doing something you're really, truly passionate about, you truly love, mm. ADHD people have no problem staying in that on spot. And mm. I call this hyper-focus. And I will say that when I am in hyper-focus, I will forget to eat, sleep, and drink. The world will disappear, and I will do the work of 10 people. It is, I can't even begin to say how superhuman it feels. The flip side of the coin is that you do need to eat, sleep, and drink. <laughs> and so it is not healthy for you to be in that on mode all the time. And 
it can get very addictive to be in that mode. Because when you're in that mode, what you achieve is so wonderful. People will recognize you for it. They will praise you for it. Your business will go good. And you for a while will think, and this is what you're going to get into your 30s if you're so lucky to find a way to tame your horse. By the end of your 30s, you may find yourself that you have been in the on mode for so much that you forgot to also cherish the off mode. Mm. So mm. I would just say, don't forget yeah. about that. Give yourself time and grace to recharge. It's not healthy to be in hyper-focus mode. But once you achieve it, you do unlock an incredible superpower. And the key of it is to do something you're passionate about. Yeah. Truly passionate about. Okay. Very wise words, Alexander. Thank you very much for that. And I think people that are listeners that have shared experiences would definitely be able to get inspiration from what you said. And I think that's really important about having time to switch off, time to de-stress, to regulate, re like regulate yourself, I think is super important. Let's move on to your current business, which is you're a co-founder in Inc., which is a patented AI to reverse engineer what Google is looking for in its content. That's your words that I've I've picked up. So can you tell me in a bit more detail what your business does, what you're looking to do? Who are your clients? Who do you work with? Right. So reverse engineering with Google's thinking. I think there's this movie, What Women Want, and this mm -hmm. actor can all of a sudden, like, you know, sometimes as men, we have the reputation, women tell us something and we don't quite get it, what they really mean. Yes. <laughs> and if only we could really understand or truly speak their language and yes. really understand what they were saying, life would go so much easier, right? I envy people who can really have that in intuitive emotional communication and really get it because I struggle like many men to, to, to always understand that. But Google and Facebook and all these other platforms, they are black boxes. Mm -hmm. They operate with neural networks and we don't know what they want. It's true. Nobody can tell, even if, the past, it was easy. The past, we are like, oh yeah, ranking factor, one, two, three. Three times your keyword in the first paragraph and blah, 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 this density. And do, do, do. and it can tell you exactly how to rank in Google. Not so anymore. Okay. So, and I was working in the field of machine learning 2008. And from 2008 to 2012, I was building computer vision algorithms that with brilliant people and we were saying like, you recognize a face because it's something like a nose is in between something that looks like eyes. Mm -hmm. So if you have a pirate, I'm like, good luck. You're not a face. But that was how things used to be done. And then there was an innovation called CUDA. And somebody figured out that you can use graphic processing units, like the, the ones you use for computer games, to train a neural network on a data set and it could make its own conclusions on why this looked like a face. All you had to do was say, here's a thousand pictures and here's where the face is. And the AI would figure out for itself yeah. what a face looked like. I didn't have to teach it, oh, look for this and look for that feature anymore. No. And then Facebook came out and said, oh, we can now detect cats in pictures. And we all know like cats run the internet. So that was the end of the internet. So when I saw that happening, I'm like, this old way of doing ML is dead. And because I was in the marketing air, it was in marketing field, I also realized there is no way Google's not going to start using this for improving search results. There's no way. They're going to use a neural network to interpret text. So like I'm talking about 2013 full on realization this was going to happen. So by 2016, Google announced this thing called Rank Brain. This is them basically coming out and admitting that they're doing this. Okay. And so when that happened, I talked to my co-founders now and I said, this is going to happen. And they told me, prove it. So that's what we did. We built an agency, enterprise agency, 
grew our clients by millions and millions of visitors a month. Like truly astonishing, really successful agency. And while we were there, we realized this process needs to be automated. We need to use artificial intelligence. The systems that are out there were either rule-based optimization of content, or I would say very primitive natural language processing, like just extracting common words or entities or something. Yeah. Yeah. And so it wasn't enough because that's not how neural networks work. So the idea is, what if we could peer into the black box? And what if we can find out what Google wants by creating our own neural network of content that ranks high and compare why high ranking content is different than low ranking content. And we looked at it on a semantic level. When we did that, it took several years of R&D. I was just about to say, before you go any further, how long did it take from start point to today to be able yeah. to build that software with the AI, the natural language processing behind yeah. it to get to your where you are now? Yeah, so the core AI was completed in 2019. So I'd say about two years. It wasn't very usable for the agency staff at that time. We had to continue to refine it. So about 2021, um, we continued to refining it. But the important thing is we done we did not need to make money selling it. We were able to just build it and leverage it in our agency to get more business and okay. make our clients win. So and it did, was you, not did you until... go through venture capital funding? Did you go around no, rounds? This was all bootstrapped. Okay. Yeah, we were operating a service business. I can't just disclose numbers. I need to check with my Don't team what I can numbers, and can't but, say. Yeah. But our profit margins were extremely high for a services business. And that's because we have a company value of innovation. And so for the sake of human dignity and life, everything that can be automated, a human shouldn't be doing. A human should be doing things that fulfill them not busy work and repeatability. Mm. So mm. this process originally took too much human time and eventually got automated. And so we lived every process in our agency. We lived by that principle of automating the common stuff. And late 2021, November 2021, so a year and four, four months ago, we sold that agency and spun out the technology. And then last year, we spent a year of turning that technology into a consumer product, something that people would want to use. And so today, inkforall.com is, is available to consumers. And it's basically the kind of technology that powered people's websites that helped agencies grow them by millions and millions of visitors a month. It's now available to, to So you've got to this, everyone. this is the free version that you're talking about, is it? Well, there is no free version right now. We did a free version while we did the agency and did not need to monetize. Ever since we need to pay the bills, we need sure. to charge for it. <laughs> and so the agency was Edgy Labs. That's right, isn't it? Correct. Yeah. And so that was founded with the same people that you've the, the co-founders are the same as Inc. Yeah. If you find amazing co-founders, you tend to you do stay with stuff them. with them. <laughs> Absolutely. So as marketing. It seems to be a theme through the last period of your life that marketing has been super important with your agency, with what you're doing now. Now, most of my listeners are business owners or entrepreneurs. They see the value of marketing and sales being super important to be able to build a successful business. What for you in the marketing arena when it's regarding technology is the most critical point and what as business owners we should be looking to be involved in? It depends on where you are in your business. So right? let's just say a B2B business, for yeah. example. If you're just starting out, the most important thing for marketing is to truly understanding the one thing you solve for your customer and who is the starving crowd for that. Too many companies are, when they start out, are all over the place. And they are too excited about too many things and fail to focus on that one thing that sets them apart. And oftentimes 
worst products end up winning the market because they just focus their messaging on that one problem that have, that their core customers have. And then they're puzzled, like, why didn't we win the market? We're obviously better. Well, it's about your messaging and your targeting. In our product, we help users with, with that by messaging with our tool, keyword research that is targeted around solving an audience objective. So we, okay. before we do keyword research, you don't just type in the word, hit enter. You also have, you get some AI help to brainstorm your audience and brainstorm the objective. If those objective and audiences do not align with the thing you're selling, don't even start, okay. right? Then the second thing that for companies that are a bit bigger, the main thing I see happening there is that they're saying we're gonna we're gonna do some organic content marketing. Let's start writing. <laughs> and they have a blog, and you look at these blogs, and then like one day it's about this, then it's about that, then it's about that, and it's just like a stream of consciousness all over the place. Mm. Search engines no longer reward you for that. Okay. You might as well just write it in your diary and leave it in your leave it in your closet. It's just it's wasted. <laughs> if content is not found, engage or converting, it's might as well not be online at all. And so what you need to do is you need to become a topical authority. Okay. If that means writing 20,000 articles about apples like healthline.com, mm -hmm. so be it. If apples is your thing and it's really your jam, then go for apples. But whatever it is for your business, pick the most important thing and then become the expert on it online. And the way you do that is by creating content hubs and you can use keyword clustering technology that we have built in our, tech, in our tool stack to do that. If you do that, you're going to be astounded at how much you can capture of the market that seeks that specific topic and you're attracting the right audience and you're converting that traffic. It's easy to convert traffic when you're hyper-focused on the thing people search for when they're trying to solve that problem. It solves so many other problems. Sun Tzu says, if you know your enemy, you do not need to fear the outcome of a thousand battles. No. That's what we're talking about. And then finally, if you do have those insights, then it's just about operational execution. You need to create content velocity while maintaining the quality and consistency. And now you can start talking about all the SEO things, the quality of your content, I think helps with that too. But also how good your site is optimized and things like that. But that's just operations, right? This is just execution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you would be astounded at how much of your paid media, paid clicks you can replace with organic marketing. Astounded. You can easily take one-tenth of your spend and in organic marketing, you can outperform your organic marketing with one-tenth of the spend. Really? Okay. The reason, or the reason paid marketing is popular is because people don't have patience. Paid marketing is instant reward. And also attribution is really easy to prove how the funnel works. Money in, money out, it's an easy calculation. So when you go to your CFO or whoever makes the purchasing decisions or budget, sets the budget, and you tell them, give me some money for this or that project, and you can't quantify what that's going to do for the business, it's mm -hmm. harder to get those budgets approved, mm -hmm. even if they're actually better for you. And so mm -hmm. I don't say stop your paid marketing. I'm just saying stop throwing money away and diversify a little bit. That's a really good idea. So you've talked about how you've been relentless about automating things within AI, your AI tool. Some people are fearful of the role of AI and the fact that you're trying to automate things, people think they're going to lose jobs. They're going to, they're going to be redundant from being necessary. For example, I was looking at a content provider who, instead of you having to record videos, you 
put the blog in and then you get an AI person speaking your content. What's your view on AI, the risk of AI, and as you're in the middle of trying to automate as much as you can in business? Right. So content creators and businesses right now need to know something. It's very important. I'm going to take out some pencils here. Let's do like a makeshift PowerPoint. Okay. This, is, uh, this is how our grandparents used to do it before screens. <laughs> <laughs> this is the content supply curve here. Yeah. Exponential. This is the demand curve, right? Humans have only so many hours in the day to consume content. And it's not like we're growing exponentially at this point. Yeah. Content supply with AI is growing like this. So what do you have? Supply and demand. Yeah. S- uh, signal to noise ratio. The gap between it is called the performance gap. Your content gets lost in the noise exponentially mm. more. Mm. Most important thing that you should keep in mind with AI and the role of AI and the risk of AI for your business in, when it comes to content marketing is how are you going to remain relevant that you are the one out of a million that still gets found and consumed right. by these people. Right. And that is content performance. Everybody is hyping about AI gener- the generation. But without optimization, your fast, quick, amazing one-click button essay, whatnot, will not be read by anyone. It is the carbon dioxide of the internet. Right. So performance is going to be very important. Invest in quality. Invest in unique insights and data. You will be rewarded for it a thousandfold. Your right. competitors are all falling in the trap of, hey, I can push a button and I have an article. Mm. You swim against the water sw- and against the stream. Mm. Focus on quality. You do that, you're going to win. Now, the question of AI in general and what impact for business is going to be outside of the marketing space and for society in general, it's a very large topic we can easily spend an hour talking about. Sure. It is going to be one of the most disruptive experiences of our lifetimes. It is going to challenge political theory, economic theory, societal theory. It is going to even accelerate our notions of what is a human being and accelerate transhumanism. It is going to unleash a number of events in the world in sequence. The first thing is going to eliminate scarcity of knowledge workers or knowledge work. What happens when supply becomes infinite and demand is not exponentially increasing? The value plummets to a commoditization. That's phase one. Phase two is going to be a post-scarcity society when it comes to labor. Phase three is a post-scarcity society when it comes to raw material with space mining and things like that. Okay. So in each of these three phases, the world is going to radically have to rethink social order and big philosophical questions and how to organize society. What works today will not work tomorrow. The ideas may be repurposed but they will have to be radically rethought. It's likely going to be the generation of like our children who are going to probably come up with these frameworks. But in each phase, and the phase that we are entering right now is the transition to a post-scarcity knowledge economy. And that transition will initially affect I would say low knowledge workers and specialists to an extent. They will disproportionately initially affect countries that are, I would be describing them like rising economies. Okay. A lot of the rising economies are seeing their economies grow by trends of wealthier countries of offshoring, I would say, human intelligence required, but lesser knowledge specialization. Mm. And that is the first front of this. It will, if you're at the coastline when a hurricane comes or tsunami, you're first hit. 
they're yeah. going to be first hit. Okay. That's going to create an imbalance in the world economy and cause human tragedy unless we find a way to offset the economic impact for those people. Then that wave is going to come to the West as it's going to also start affecting knowledge workers. It is unfair and it is, in fact, inhuman for us to tell the knowledge workers of the world who are affected as such something to the equivalent of learn to code. Not everybody can reschool four times in 10 years as AI continues to be more efficient. Yeah. And so we're going to have to really grapple with that. And then an automation, it's the same thing. Automated manufacturing combined with a demographic crisis in Asia mm -hmm. is going to is going to basically really accelerate that transition to robotics, a robotic future. And so the second wave of scarcity is going to follow quickly after that. Anyhow, how it's going to look like for a business. Can I just is... say one thing, Alexander? I think the important thing for people that are listening to this is that we've been through cycles of change before. We had a huge industrialization where you could build cars and you would build, you'd build manufacturing and people lost jobs in the farms, in the fields. And yes, there is always that, what you've said to that people say, oh, well, you should just retrain to go into this or go into that. Which, as you say, is not always fair. It's not always able to. But we are we are at the cusp of change actually happening within society, within finance, within economics, within supply, within within most industries. And I think it's really important that we, instead of being fearful and scared of it, we should try and embrace it and we should try and use that technology. And rather than be fearful of it, try and use the benefits and be able to embrace these sorts of technologies. So I do think as a as the human race, as the West, as being a human being that is going through this revolution with AI and blockchain, for example, the two prime examples that I've been aware of and seen in, in, in the last 10 years, I think people... All right. Yes, it's hard to retrain to become a coder to get into the area, but I think it is important that we should be in, trying to embrace the technology rather than be fearful and attack it. Yes, and so the first, the first way that the first way we're going to see this take impact in the industry is businesses are going to be able to do more with less people. And so capitalism still drives the world. Yeah. So if people become 10 times more efficient, you can imagine there will be 10 times more startups competing with you. And you can imagine that the cost for those services might decrease 10 times. Mm. Mm. Right? Because remember, anything that it relates to scarcity has an economic effect. Absolutely. So prices should theoretically plummet for several knowledge type work yeah and also competition will get a lot more fierce so mm. for businesses this will be something to deal with how can you so i want to point this out the individual this current generation of ai will not replace any human job okay it will instead be operated by a human and will make that human 10 times more efficient at doing that job. Right. right. Now, future generations of AI, and I don't know how to time this because everything is on an exponential time scale currently, but future versions of AI could potentially replace some jobs. But I think that the initial wave is definitely going to be requiring an expert human, fill in the blank, whatever the job is, and just oh. make that human more efficient. Right. But that also means that if that person can now do the job of several others, that these other resources are no longer needed, then those other resources are going to find their way to companies who always wanted a person like that, but couldn't have such a person and mm -hmm. will themselves be using AI. So I would definitely say if you do not embrace AI, for sure, you will be replaced by a human who will use AI. So that is important to stay up to date in whatever your industry is, the first way that you're going to see this is all the tools that already solve a problem today 
will just embrace such technology. Yeah. So just continue in the stack that you're working. If they embrace this technology, mm. you're doing the right thing. Mm. Mm. You do not have to become a coder, and so to speak. Yeah. Now, there is a final society that you can imagine where all this ends up, where we're just all happy taking care of each other as human beings. I often say computers don't bleed. They don't fall in love. They don't have pheromones. And all of their so-called wisdom is secondhand. They don't have a firsthand human experience, only a rationalized human approximation. And so nothing can replace a handshake, a hug, a genuine smile. Mm -hmm. And I think that potentially the future for humanity is one where we have an opportunity to lean more into what makes us human. Because let's be real, since this morning, 8 a.m., I have been in a few meetings and I have about 200 emails that are unopened right now. Mm. We were not made for that. Mm. This is mm. unnatural. Mm. And I think that we have an opportunity and it is truly an opportunity, but also a warning when we can create the future of humanity, we have an opportunity, we have a fresh canvas to imagine the type of world that we want our great grandchildren to inherit, mm. just like great thinkers of old have paved the way for the freedoms that we enjoy today and the life we have today. Yeah. I think we do have a responsibility to navigate this in a responsible way for future generations. Absolutely. Look, Alexander, it's been amazing speaking to you today. We're coming to the end of the interview. I ask the same six questions to all of my guests. They're quickfire questions. They put, they don't need a quickfire answer. The first question is, what's the best decision that you've made? I'm trying to think if this is on a personal life level or business level. Whichever, or, whichever one you yeah. want. I will keep my answer to a business answer. I think for business and for work, the most important decision is to choose who you work with as your partners. And also that you do things that are extremely fulfilling that you can believe in. Work is not, work should not just be work. It should be your passion. Right. Next one. What's the best advice you've been given? The best advice I would say is the advice I have ignored the most, but needed the most. And it is to really learn to slow down at times. People keep repeating it, but without a clarity break, you tend to just see the the trees and not the forest. And it Absolutely. is very important to, to take care of yourself. So maybe you should ones, maybe you should start a gratitude list. Maybe I should. To everyone who keeps telling me this advice throughout the years, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Who's the person that's helped you most in your career? No. Honestly, I think it's my business partners, both of them in different ways. I think that when you go in business, there's like a trinity of things you need in a business. You need an amazing operator. You need a revenue person who can open doors for you. And then you need some kind of visionary or technology person or whatever, a person who can get stuff done, mm -hmm. right? And has some vision about how to get that done. It's very hard to do all three things, even if you're talented and capable, you don't have time to focus on those three areas. I was fortunate enough to find partners who are complementing me in the operational and revenue side. And I have learned so much from both of them. From there's, a book, there's a book, Alexander, called The E-Myth, which I think all entrepreneurs should read. It's by Michael Gerber. And it's a very similar thing. You have a practitioner, you have an operations person, you have a visionary. And, okay. and their, 
that's how you create a successful business is by having those three practitioners or those three different people. So I think that's really good advice. Next question is, tell me about a regret that you have. I don't really do regrets. You only should. When you really mess up, you can only really mess up if you treated another human being with less dignity than they deserve. And then you need to go and apologize and make right with those people. But when it comes to business and what you do and everything else, regret is not appropriate when it was an opportunity for you to learn and grow from it. Mm. And you should only have regret if you did something that was not helping you grow, that did not also help you move in the direction you wanted to go. Absolutely. And so I I try to learn from my experiences and I, I do feel like I have grown from them. So I would say that even if the things I do today don't work out, I will not have regret. I would have regret if I did not see it through and didn't give it my all because I would Absolutely. wonder what would happen, what would have, what might have been. But if I do everything I can and I learn from my failures, then it is still a success. Absolutely. Next question is, what are you most proud of? My children. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They're our greatest additions to the world and this, the next generation of humanity. And I think every generation has to learn a lesson and pass on that wisdom and progress to their children. We cannot go back in time. I think our generation had to learn with, had to deal with topics of how we treat other people with more equality. I think mm. we had to learn some really hard lessons. Mm. Forget all the debate. Just look at how some people were treated. And mm. so just the fact that we talk about this and we say that's not okay anymore. Sure, you can go too far, but everyone will admit that we had lessons to learn. Yeah. And so it's important for us to pass those lessons on to our children. And then they can figure out what the next lessons are that they yeah. that we did wrong that they can improve on. The next question is, what does legacy mean to you? I think that legacy is something I historically have attributed too much importance to in the sense of the ego. And I like to be, I like to become a person who is more humble about it and instead focuses on simpler things like how did I make people feel and how did I treat others? Yeah. It's fantastic. fantastic. And lastly, where can people find you if they want to reach out to you? Let's see, uh, inkforall.com, LinkedIn, Twitter. We have a Discord server, a Facebook group. Or you know what? Just email me, alexander at inkforall.com. I'll reply. That's amazing. Somewhere between my 200 emails. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do my best. How about that? I won't uh, promise. No, I think anymore, that's but... <laughs> absolutely fine. I think that's absolutely fine. Thank you so much for your time, Alexander. I was not expecting such a philosophical conversation. It's been really enlightening. I think you are an amazing human being. And that whole point that you started on, that you try to self self reflect on things you do well and things you suffer with and struggle with. I think that is an amazing thing that as a, not just a someone in business an entrepreneur, but just as a human being, we should try and think about self reflecting, thinking about our strengths, thinking about our weaknesses. I think it's a great lesson for all of us. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Bye. Bye.